directions for you that you take it. The new one, today's, this is today's. Right. It's your first time here. And I also need to know if anyone is interested in the, the ticket to heaven. <laughs> the, the red notebook. We're going to need to mix them up this week for the kids at school. So if you want one of these, uh, Disciples Notebook, again, in there, there's, it's divided into four sections along with Acts 2.42, the Apostles' Doctrine, Fellowship, and Breaking the Bread and Prayer. And of course, for that prayer list, you can put it back in your prayer section, and I keep track of that as well. And also, I had some requests for some of the uh, books, so the books are available to be printed again as well. This is the, uh, this is the story about the church. The Church of the Cross. Uh, reclaiming the heart and soul of the church at the cross through transformational accountability. So that was our, uh, our doctoral uh, work there that we finished back in uh, May of 2013. So got all that for you. And then, of course, uh, if you need an outline thing, you got everybody got an outline for today. So we'll be all set. All right. Anybody want to share from their prayer this first week? Uh, their scripture they were reading or their um, some thoughts that happened? I know there's a couple that share already, but if you want to share, you do? Go ahead, yeah. Okay, Deuteronomy 25-7, do not worship any God except me. Then 1 Thessalonians, always be grateful, always be joyful, and never stop praying. So the physical would be praying for Oliver to recover, and the spiritual would be prayer keeps us joyful. Very good. Well, update on Albert. Update, see? You know, he's, he's free, and I guess they call him the Chandler Latin House. Yeah. The Carter Carter's closing down. All right. Good. Who else? You can want to share a little. Yeah, we didn't bring our red notebook today, so I'm not sure I'm getting into heaven. Oh, that's true, so be careful. <laughs> But um, I can I can look at um, Isaiah um, number one. I guess I can just rely on the word of God, right? Please do. Um, and Isaiah one um, thirteen. Bring no more futile sacrifices. Incense is an abomination to me. The new moon, the Sabbaths. The calling of assemblies. I cannot endure iniquity and the sacred meaning. Your new moons and your appointed feasts, my soul hates. They are a trouble to me, and I am weary of bearing them. And then I think we went to, oh, I wish I could have my book. Uh, it's a New Testament scripture, um, was um, Romans. 12, 1, uh, it's really hard without the notebook though. Um, um, Romans 12, 1, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and accessible to God, which is your reasonable service. Um, in other translations, the um, Isaiah, well, in 13 it says, bring no more futile sacrifices. So I kind of related that to uh, bring your body as a sacrifice in, in the New Testament part. And um, we've just been praying for the kids and the uh, grandkids. And <laughs> yeah, we had an opportunity to go and go do a little, go out on a visitation. Yeah, and uh, minister a little bit. And got three, four little angels here this morning. Yeah, they came to so visit us. So. Came to visit. So praise the Lord for that. I'm excited. Yeah. So we get you guys plugged in and begin our quest again for all the children. That's how we began our church with uh, 12 adults and 200 kids back in the day. So uh, getting back to that, of course, with the school being able to minister. Let me just uh, speak out some names for you to pray.
for, for new students and students that also that we have had that have gone on to college as well. So from kindergarten to college, here's some names that you can pray for. Hezekiah and Faith and Bailey and Elise and Kyle and Mateo and Nicholas and Dion, Andrew, Kaylee, Miranda, Hannah, Everett, Austin, Wyatt, Adam, Gage, Brian, and Jacob, and Grace. Woo! That's for the school starting tomorrow. And I pray for especially for Miranda. She's got some family issues that the Lord's going to work through. And then also this morning, uh, Joel, Micaiah, and Daniel uh, should be at church at uh, Brevard Westland across the street from school. So that's Joel, Micaiah, and Daniel, three Bible names there that you can remember as well, that uh, they would be a light. Uh, that Brevard College is an interesting, got some interesting history to it. it back in the 1800s that the Methodist Church started the school. And uh, of course, you know how much we love uh, John Charles Wesley. But um, kind of, you know, as, some, as many schools have, they've kind of gone stray. But uh, they just hired a new uh, chaplain for the school this year. And there's a great church across the street, the Brevard Wesleyan Church, that has a great, uh, we've been there a few times now, and it's, it just has great things going on. So we're hoping that they'll really be able to minister to the, to the college students there and really begin to. Oh, and John McKay and Daniel will step up, you know, and really be leaders there and get involved in what's going on. So that's exciting. So a lot, a lot to pray for. So especially in these six, six days of prayer. And of course, one of the main reasons that we really felt like we needed to go to prayer was because of what's at stake. We've been talking about with this election that's going on. All the different issues from the Supreme Court issues to... Uh, First Amendment rights, Second Amendment rights, I mean the whole nine yards, all that's going on within our public school systems, uh, you know, there's two very distinct differences in these two candidates that we have. And, uh, so I think it's more than just uh, vote your conscience, I think you've got to look at the issues. And if you're a Christian, I can't imagine that you have a hard choice on this matter. So Whoa. praise the Lord for that. Anyway, so uh, where we're going to go uh, in that thought is uh, back to the Gospel of John. John's my book. It's been my book for a while after Galatians, of course. But uh, going back to the Gospel of John. <clears throat> and, uh, of course, we know that the Gospel of John is, we're calling it the Kingdom Revelation Series. Gospel of John, the, really the main verse if you were to pick out like we like to do in our saturation of Jesus and His Word. Uh, really John 1.14 really is one of the key verses in the book of John. How the Word of God literally became flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld His glory and the glory of the only begotten Son full of grace and truth. So this is the idea that Jesus has come to reveal himself to us. We are seeing what God looks like, so to say, what he how he lives, what he thinks. And Jesus coming, Jesus setting aside, as Paul would say in Philippians 2, setting aside his godlike qualities. <clears throat> emptying himself of all but love. Philippians 2, 5 through 8, the old kenosis passage. The emptying, emptying of all of himself, his godlike qualities. The second person of the Trinity, we sang about it, leaping off the throne of God and becoming 100% USDA man. Him coming like us so we can become like him. Good news, isn't it? Yeah. Uh, so that's what we're seeing. Of course, in the summertime, we were talking about parables. But hey, as I was been reading back in John again, that issue of parables is going to come up here. It comes up in, in John 9 as well. Uh, so let me just give you just a quick review. 
Uh, there's some miracles that take place in the Gospel of John in particular. And by the time you get to John chapter 9, uh, miracle number 6 is about to take place. This, this great sign, this great miracle. Uh, so let's go ahead and look at this story. Uh, John chapter 9, we're going to focus in on verses 1 through 11. But we might want to read a little bit more of the story because it's, uh, again, really interesting here. Uh, John chapter 9. And we're calling uh, today's title is The Sight, S-I-T-E, The Sight of Sight. A little tongue twister for you this morning. The Sight of Sight. John chapter 9, verse 1. Now as Jesus passed by, he saw a man who was blind from birth. And his disciples asked Jesus, saying, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Jesus answered, neither this man nor his parents sinned, but that the works of God should be revealed. In him. This is our revelation word, right? Revealed. Jesus goes on to say, I must work the works of him who sent me while it is day. The night is coming when no one can work. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. And when he said these things, Jesus spat on the ground and made clay with the saliva. And he anointed the eyes of the blind man with the clay. And he said to him, Go, wash in the pool of Siloam, which is translated sent. So he went and washed and came back seeing. Therefore the neighbors and those who previously had seen that he was blind said, Is not this he who sat and begged? Some said, this is he. Others said, he is like him. He said, I am he. Therefore they said to him, how were your eyes opened? He answered and said, a man called Jesus made clay and anointed my eyes and said to me, go to the pool of Siloam and wash. So I went and washed, and I received sight. Amen. Jesus, uh, what a miracle. <sighs> How you can take a, a tragic situation, a situation that neither this man or this, his parents had any bearing on. There was no sin in their lives that, that caused this man to be blind. And you entered into this situation. And you revealed yourself. And you showed us that you truly are the light of the world. Father, as we were singing that song about the cross, I think this morning, this September 11th, how we've pledged never to forget tragedy that took place on our soil. If you sang that song about the cross, I saw that picture of President Bush standing there in the rubble and seeing that twisted metal and that cross being shown there. That picture forever being burned in our hearts and our minds. So Lord, today we want to remember those who have been just touched by that tragedy, Lord. Think of all those families. We pray, Lord, for your healing power to continue in their lives. We pray, Lord Jesus, that we would continue to walk by faith in your truth and in your grace and in your mercy. We love you this day. Speak to us through the power of your word, we pray. May it truly be food for our souls. In your name, Jesus, we pray. Amen. So this, uh, in, in and of itself, is really, it could be a parable, too. There's a lot of uh, 
talk back and forth between uh, the light and the darkness, uh, the physical and the spiritual. Of course, you remember when we talked about the parables this summer. Uh, you know, there was this, uh, the thought and the intent of the whole, of the whole parable was to, to bring, to share with you a, a physical story, uh, a life lesson, so to say, and to point you to Jesus, to the kingdom of God, you know, the spiritual truth there. And again, that's what Jesus is, is wanting to do here in this uh, sixth miracle that John uh, takes place there. Of course, you know and realize there's no power in the, in the spittle that was formed. But the power, Jesus is the power, amen? As yes. we've prayed this morning, He is our healer. Yes. He is our salvation. Yes. He is our hope. Yes. He is our joy. Yes. He is the I Am. Woo. He just doesn't do those things. He is those things. Yes. And that's a big deal. That's a big difference. So, uh, let's just kind of unpack this a little bit here on these first 11 verses. Um, here's the proposition we talked about here. And it's interesting that it goes on as you read the rest of the story. We'll continue it as the weeks go by. But um, there's some deception that takes place uh, throughout the story. Uh, there's some, uh, some blasphemy, of course. Those who are calling... The bla calling out a blasphemer are, in essence, blaspheming themselves. And uh, there's some, some proclamation and praise, and there's some doubt throughout this. But uh, this blind man, again, uh, received, received his sight. So I want to say this morning that our hearts must be in their proper position. That's a definition for sight, S-I-T-E. It's a Latin word that literally means position or situation. Or on Wednesday nights, which we're going to change over to Tuesday nights too for our study pretty soon, talking about a seat, getting your seat we've been talking about. Stay in your seat, in your position, yeah. right? So the sight. So our hearts must be in their proper position in order for our eyes to to see clearly or to receive sight. Does that make sense? So our hearts have to be right, have to be in proper position in order for us to truly see uh, or really receive sight. It's one thing to see spiritually, I mean physically, right? <clears throat> and completely another thing to see spiritually. Um, just because you see something Physically, doesn't really mean you might believe. And what about those, as Jesus said, who, who believe and have yet not seen? Yeah, right. So here's an interesting uh, thought here in, in these first 11 verses. All right, so uh, starting in verses 1 through 3, uh, Jesus comes on the scene. He sees this blind man from birth. And immediately the disciples ask, uh, who sinned? Uh, of course, there was a thought back in the day, and I'm pretty sure that thought is still pretty... Uh, is, a, is, a, is pretty much alive and well today. Um, we look at a situation, we see someone with a, a, tri a trial or a tribulation or uh, a physical ailment uh, like they did back in, in Jesus' time and even before, and they see this ailment, this, <clears throat> this um, blindness, and they attribute it to some kind of sin. Jesus said, wait a second, nobody sinned here. Nobody sinned. Uh, if you remember from our board, we live in a, in a fallen world. Yes. And one of the age-old questions we try to talk about or try to address a lot of times is, why do good things, why do bad things happen to good people? Well, we live in a fallen world, for one. And uh, sin is alive and well in our world. But yet there is the truth of Jesus that sets us free. Right. He is the chain breaker. Right. He is the one who sets us free. <clears throat> so Jesus has, addresses this to his disciples because they were under the impression that, well, this man has this problem. There must have been some kind of sin. Now, 
we spent some time a few years back in the book of Job. And it was the same thought process back then. The trials and tribulations that Job went through had nothing to do with sin. The man was holy. The man was without was blameless. He sought after God. He was faithful. And yet, many, many bad things happened to him. His kids were, were killed. They lost his, his land, his fortune. His wife basically told him to, to, to curse God and die. And die. I mean, you are a pitiful sight, Joe. You, you are not the man I married. Uh, his own friends came out to, to mourn with him and, and tried to give him some support and wisdom, and yet we find out that his friends were, were just as lost. But Job was faithful in all of that. And he believed and he knew that God was going to show up, and show up he did in a whirlwind, did he? And he said something in the effect that the, the eye of his soul, man, he could see with his eye, he said. When God showed up. That's so much more than what it looks like in the physical. And as we know, things aren't always as they may seem to appear. So we've got to be able to see, especially in these last days, we've got to be able to see and discern with the eyes of our heart. So Jesus is getting to that point, I think, here in these first 11 verses. <clears throat> he takes this young man and he addresses the issue <clears throat> of this deception. Excuse me. Sight's deception. Sight deception. See, the deception is what? Well, something bad has happened to this young man. Obviously, some kind of sin must be attached to it. Sight deception. Who sinned? Did this young man sin? Did his parents sin? Jesus said, no. Nobody sinned. This has happened so that God would be revealed. Woo! Which is the whole essence of the book of John. The continual revelation of Jesus. And I would go as far as to say that would be a part of your purpose. If our purpose, as we've stated for the last, I don't know how many years now, is to be the house of God, if your purpose is to be one with Jesus, then your purpose in that <clears throat> would be to reveal Jesus in your very life. You are to be the platform, we've said, upon which He lives and moves and breathes. Woo! You are to be a Holy Spirit-empowered instrument of Almighty God. Amen. You are not a human doing. You're a human being. Yeah. Let Him be, as you pray, what He wants to do in and through you. Yeah. Let Him live His life in and through you. So in times, especially in these last days, we're seeing the lies are running rampant. I mean, whether you're looking at campaign stuff, whether you're looking at school board stuff, whether you're looking at governmental stuff, whether you're looking at business stuff, the lies are just flying all around. And the only difference, the only way you're going to be able to discern whether or not you're being deceived is unless you know what truth is. You've got to know the truth so that you can discern what the deception is. Of course, Jesus is the truth. Yes. That's right. So, of course, he can speak these thoughts of, hey, there's no sin here. This has taken place so that God would be revealed in him. Move on to verse 4 through 7. It's sight work, S-I-T-E, work. Sight work. Jesus says in verses 4 to 7, I must work the works of Him who sent me. This is how Jesus lived His life. 
Jesus just wasn't sent down from heaven and God said, Jesus, you go and do what you think is right. You go do what you believe is right. You go do what you think you need to do. I'm going to stay up here and you know, I'll send you an email every now and then. And uh, you just do your thing and we'll applaud and you'll get all the credit for it. That's not how he lived his life. That's right. A major uh, theme throughout the book of John, of course, is Jesus didn't do anything except what the Father did in and through him. Jesus is the perfect example of what it looks like to be a human being. I am so sick and tired of hearing whether it's an old song from the 80s or whether whatever it is, or these commercial on TV now that says, we're only human. As if that is some less than thing. God created humans. Genesis 1. He created humans in his likeness, in his image. And I know that God don't make no junk. That's right. So to say, I'm only human, which I grew up with this song, born to make mistakes, <clears throat> is just an absolute lie and deception. You were born to be the house of God. That's right. You were born to be the temple of the Holy yeah. Spirit. You weren't born to sin. You can choose to sin if you so choose to. But if Jesus is running wild in your life, why would you want to sin? How could you sin? He's Lord of your life. Now, if you want to turn your back on Him, if you want to take over the reins, if you want to take, be in the driver's seat, whatever those, however that works for you, if you want to do that, that's totally up to you. But that's not how Jesus lived his life with the Father. You can go back to the, the great temptation of Christ and in, uh, in, in the temptation scene in Matthew 4 and see how Jesus came against temptation and trials. Man shall not what? Live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. There's another parable for you. Physical versus the spiritual. So in verse 4, he tells us again, I must work the works. It's not like a must, like I have to. It's, it's a statement that says, this is the fruit of my life. Because of my relationship with the Father, the works of the Father come through me. Because of your relationship with Jesus, the works of Jesus come through you. Now, maybe the works of Satan come through you. Well, who do you have a relationship with? There were days I remember that, uh, hey, my theology was all messed up before I got saved. So, I thought, you know, and I believe God loved me. Hey, the songs we sang, I believe. The three-in-one trinity, hey, you could, all the foundational truths of Christianity, I believe, yet I was not in right relationship with Him. My heart was not in its proper position. Wow. So I was not about the works of the Father. I was about the works of the flesh. The works of self, the works of Satan. And he goes on to say this, as long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. Jesus is the light of the world. Where truth comes against deception, where the light dispels the darkness. And as he said these things, he anointed the eyes of the blind man. And he said to the blind man, Go, wash in the pool of Siloam. And the man responded, didn't he? And he went and he washed. And he came back to see. Talk about blind faith. He literally had blind faith then. Yeah. And his blind faith became crystal clear, didn't it? Uh, the third part there, just, just trying to unpack this a little bit for us. So you see this man, he is, he's come back, he's seeing, and then verse 8 begins, 
Uh, so his neighbors, his friends, those who had known him for all the years uh, as a blind man uh, have now questioned. The sight, the, the proper position of their hearts, really, is questioned here. The sight is questioned, S-I-T-E. Not so much the physical sight, but it's, it's more, it goes deeper than that. And how can you question it when he says he sees you now? You can't really question it because it's happened. So the questioning is really deeper than, than this physical sight. The questioning that's going on in about is their hearts. They're questioning because their hearts aren't right, right? So therefore, the neighbors and those who previously had seen that he was blind said, Is this he who sat and begged? Some said this is he, others said it's, well, he is like him, as if they did a switch. Well, it's kind of like him. Well, you know, his, his disciples went and they stole the body. <laughs> it's like him. But the man said, I am he, it's me. This is me. The one who was blind, but now I can see. Woo. So they asked the question, well then how were your eyes opened? You gotta love that question, right? You gotta love when people ask you why something has happened to you. Why are you so happy in this terrible situation? Why is there this glow about you? Why is there this strength I can see about you? Why don't you curse that boss like everyone else does? <laughs> Verse 11. Let me tell you about S-I-G-H-T. Sight by faith. The man who was blind since birth said, a man called Jesus. He made some clay, anointed my eyes, and he said to me, go into the pool of Siloam and wash. So I went and washed, and I received sight. Wow. This positioning, or the sight of our hearts, is so crucial. So that we can clearly see and receive sight. As you go on in the story, the man is given more opportunity to give praise, to give thanks, uh, to worship. And through that, the religious leaders scoff. Don't believe cast deception and dispersion, and so forth. Can we see clearly in these last days with all the deception that's running rampant around us, with all the lies with all the propaganda, with all the stuff that you have to deal with in your lives. How can you make sure that your hearts are in their proper place, their proper sight, so that you can continue to see clearly receive sight, to discern with the eyes of our hearts this cleansing that this man received, this physical cleansing to give him physical sight. He could already see, couldn't he? And that kind of seeing he was believing before you even have physical sight. 
you know all the different examples. The old Doubting Thomas. Or Thomas gets a bad rap, we know. But I look at the positive side of Thomas and say, hey, Thomas wanted to see with his own eyes. And Jesus said, here you go, Thomas. But blessed are those who believe and have not seen. Is there an issue in your life this morning that's causing you some kind of great grief? That's causing you to question to question God? To question an issue of sin? The greatest thing, one of the greatest things about holiness is that if there is sin in your life, guess what you can do? You can respond. You can die to yourself. Yes. You can offer yourself a living sacrifice. That's right. You can be crucified with Christ so you no longer live, but Christ now lives in you. And Paul makes it so clear that we do not have to continue in sin any longer. This, uh, I just wanted to tell you this one last thing. This, this washing word that takes place in this verse has, it mentions this whole idea of sanctification that we talk about. And this man was told to go and wash. And wash, there's different words for the word wash, but this word wash had to do with a particular area. And what Jesus wanted him to do was what? Wash. The, the clay off his face. Over in uh, John, what was it, 13, I think. Where Peter uh, is asked to uh, wash the disciples' feet. And Jesus says, this is um, John 13, 7, the Last Supper scene. Jesus came to Simon Peter and said, Peter, you are, and said to Jesus, Lord, are you washing my feet? When Jesus came to wash their feet, and Jesus said, well, what I'm doing now, you don't understand, but you will. After, you will know after this. And Peter said to him, you shall never wash my feet. Never say never to Jesus, right? That's right. <laughs> Jesus answered him and said, If I do wash, if I do not wash you, you have no part with me. So Peter said to Jesus, Lord, not my feet only, but also my hands and my head. So there's Peter, always over the top. But Jesus said, He who is bathed needs only to wash his feet. There's a contrast there. You don't need a whole bath here. We're just here to wash your feet. And the reason we're washing your feet is to give you, again, another parable in, in a sense. To show you this servanthood attitude. The submissive heart. It always goes back to the heart, doesn't it? It always goes back to the proper position of our hearts. So as we pray for another 66 minus 7, 53, 59, thank you. I teach math too. 59. She's withdrawn her children. <laughs> Just kidding. 59. It's the hot lights. <laughs> 59 days left. <laughs> Could we receive this kind of sight? Could we be so tuned in, so one with Jesus as we pray? Because this is what's going on here. This is really a picture of prayer. When Jesus says, I must work the works of him who sent me, 
He is, he is crying out the words he said back in John chapter 5, verse 19. Most assuredly I say to you, the Son can do nothing of himself, but what he sees the Father do for whatever he does, the Son also does in like manner. John 5.30, I can of myself do nothing. As I hear, I judge, and my judgment is righteous because I do not seek my own will, but the will of the Father who sent me. This is that kind of prayer that we talked about last week in your notebooks there. That's that word that talks. It's more than just praying and asking for something, a petition. It's a prayer of intimacy and oneness. It's, it's, it's as Oswald Chambers said, right? Prayer is not getting things from God. It's getting into communion with God. Yeah. See, this is the command. We want to practice His presence day in and day out. Through the power of the Holy Spirit. Walk in the Spirit these next days. And clearly see and be able to discern wherever we go. Whoever we come in contact with. To truly be ministers of the good news of Jesus. Yes. Let's do that together. Because we are the church at the cross. That's our way of life. The cross style way of life. Lord Jesus, thank you. And we see like you see. And we love like you love these next days. And we reach out like you reach out. May those things that concern you concern us. We offer ourselves again to you. We ask you, Lord Jesus, to run wild in our lives. To sanctify us through and through. To cleanse us. Transform us from the inside out. Truly, may we walk by faith. We trust you every second of every day. Could we have the sight of this blind man who could see you before he could physically see you? Who could believe and trust you blindly. Maybe so. Every issue that we're dealing with right now, every situation, every circumstance, every person, every trial, every tribulation, every issue, whatever's knocking at our doors this day, Lord Jesus, may we, as you said, would not handle it ourselves. May we give you complete and total authority of all that's going on in our lives. May we truly let you be Lord of all. Because if you're not Lord of all, then you're not Lord at all. We love you, Jesus. We respond to you. Holy Spirit, draw us Convict us, mold us, shape us. In these closing moments, we respond to you, Lord Jesus. The authority of you and your word in our lives. We pray we have feasted on your truth. And we'll grow and be empowered to step forth from this place in your power, in your grace, in your love, in your mercy, to see souls saved and lives transformed. Truly ministers of the gospel. Use us, Lord Jesus, we pray in your holy name. Amen. Amen. Hey, let's, let's do that. We'll come to the altars and pray this morning. If you need to, or just want to.
come and give this morning and then we'll respond together in communion.